Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Do you desire to live a praiseworthy life? When God teaches you something, you read something in His Word, something that He commands one to do, do you have a desire to do that? That is the evidence of, for example, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, a new nature that is bent to the purposes, the will of God, a desire to submit and obey and walk in the will of God. That is spiritual maturity. So someone who is filled with the Spirit, who has experienced salvation through the blood of Messiah and faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, that person is going to want to serve, obey. They're going to be extremely interested in the things of God, in His will. And not just knowing His will, but doing His will. In order to serve God, we need discernment. Now, obviously, when we look at the New Covenant teachings, we find that the Spirit of God gives discernment. But an aid in understanding this spiritual discernment is obviously the Word of God. And if we want to be a people that has spiritual discernment, especially as we move into the last days. And let me share something with you. I love prophecy. And prophecy is a catalyst for preparation. That the man of God, that the woman of God might be prepared for the future. That we might understand the expectations of God. That we might be able to discern the moving of God so that we can participate in His will and not be individuals that either by deception or simply by disobedience that we are attempting to thwart or hinder the things of God. Well, we are studying the book of Isaiah and we're now ready for chapter 15. And if you were to ask me, what is this 15th chapter about? And not just this chapter, but the next several chapters for the next several weeks of our study. We are going to be given revelation from Isaiah concerning judgment. And this judgment is falling upon individuals, nations, peoples, areas, lands, city that do not want the things of God. And the people that we're going to be studying the next couple weeks are called the Moabites, the nation of Moab. Now, remember how Moab came to be. We all remember Sodom and Gomorrah, and we remember Lot was there. We remember the faithlessness of his wife, who was turned into a pillar of salt as they were fleeing from the judgment of God. And we remember that his two daughters, instead of having a submissiveness and a trust that God is in charge, we need to submit to the instructions of God. What did they do? Well, they saw an inadequacy in the things of God. And that, that wrong perception caused them to take things into their own hands, to begin to act without revelation, without instruction from God. And they were the catalyst in producing in an incestuous relationship to people 
Ammon and Moab. Now, Moab came about because of a, a perception, a vision that doubted God, that felt that he was inadequate and wanted to act in one's own understanding. What does the scripture say? Lean not on your own understanding. But one needs to seek prophetic revelation to know what to do and what not to do. So Moab had a very ungodly origin. And that ungodly origin manifested itself in disobedience. For when the children of Israel wanted to enter into the promised land, Moab did not assist that. Moab either wanted to profit as one account tests, and another account, they wanted to not bless Israel, not participate with Israel, but they wanted to thwart the things of God. And we see two individuals that stand out prophetically and also in the Torah. I'm speaking of uh, Balak, the king of Moab, who did not want Israel to function in obedience to God's purposes. He wanted to, to thwart the things of God, destroy the children of Israel, and he hired Bil'am in order to do just that, to put a stumbling block. Now, Moab, when you think about its origin through incest, through a, a mindset that was devoid revelation, that wanted to be in control of the situation, we see that Moab, was a person, a nation, a people that, that were engaged in idolatry. And idolatry for the sake of financial, material profit. And we see three times in the New Covenant that Bilam, this false prophet that received revelation from God but did not act in obedience. We see three times in the New Covenant, for example, in 2 Peter chapter 2, in the book of Jude, just one chapter, and also in the second chapter of the book of Revelation, in that, that message to the congregation that was at Pergamos, we see that, that Bilam is mentioned as a man who is disobedient, who's not moved by the things of God, but motivated by profit. So whenever we look at Moab biblically, prophetically, we see God's displeasure because Moab was displeased with the purpose of God. And the outcome, as we're going to see, is judgment. Now, there's one more thing that I want to set forth before we look at this 15th chapter. And that is, remember, Moab saw the children of Israel moving towards the promised land in obedience to the things of God. And Moab hindered, stood in defiance, and did not want to participate in the children of Israel inhabiting the promised land. And let me say today that there is much false teaching within Christianity about God's purposes for the Jewish people in the last days and leading up to the last days. Look at what's happening. God has began to move in a very mighty way over the last 70 years, but even before that, we see in the 19th century, people hearing the call and moving out of Europe and other places to the land of Israel, to the extent that even before the land of Israel became the modern nation of Israel, approximately 700,000 Jewish people inhabited that land. And then we see little by little and more and more Jewish people, especially at the conclusion of the Holocaust, move back to this land. And it is so unfortunate today that we have the evilness, the heresy 
of replacement theology. We have individuals teaching that when the, the, the word Israel appears in the Old Testament, we need to, to remove that and think of the church. We see heresy, and let me say this. I believe without any doubt that God wants us to be more bold today, to be much more vocal and much more direct in calling out heresy. It is not sufficient for people simply to think they're studying the Word of God and learning prophecy by reading what other people have said and their interpretations oftentimes faulty in regard to prophecy. No, God wants you, you to study his word, for you to pray over it and to read it over and over and over. And the Holy Spirit, if you have received Messiah Yeshua into your life, the Holy Spirit, he will be your teacher. He will lead you to a right understanding. And don't look for ways to say, well, it says this, but, but I'm going to allegorize it. I'm going to see a symbolic meaning. I want to see this figuratively. No, no, and no. Listen to the simple revelation of God's word. Well, with that said, Isaiah chapter 15, verse 1 we're going to see God's message to Moab. Verse 1. Masa Moab. Now the word Masa comes from, from lifting something up, and not just that, but it's normally translated as a burden. It is something that is lifted up and placed upon another. And the purpose is to place stress anxiety, pressure, and ultimately that that bird would bring about either destruction or repentance. Now, for the most part, we're going to see on Moab that it brings about destruction. Why is that? Because Moab was not like Ruth. Remember Ruth? What did she do? She was this woman who said something. She said, Israel is my people and the God of Israel is my God and she left idolatry in order to embrace truth and God took this young Moabite woman who came out of an ungodly and idolatrous heritage and used her in the genealogy of Messiah Yeshua that she would have Ovid, who was the father of Yeshai, who was the father of King David. And we know that Messiah is the son of David. So do not wrongly think that God is against a particular people. No, the Bible says God is not a respecter of anyone. He respects those who turn to him in faith, wanting and seeking his grace, in order that they might live an obedient life. You know, I do not know why that, that the word obedience is so problematic today. And they say, well, if you teach obedience, you're against faith. Absolutely not. It is only through faith and a true faith that produces obedience in your life. I've never, ever, ever said one is saved by obedience. But I get so many emails accusing me of just that. No, what I teach is one is saved by God's grace through the blood of Messiah Jesus that was poured out upon that cross. And we receive God's grace solely by faith. It's a free gift. But when you have that faith, the faith that is established from the word of God, truth, then you're going to see that that faith leads you, not for the purpose of salvation, but as an expression of salvation to obey God. 
And let me simply say that if someone denies that, that they are a heretic. It is basic in the scripture that faith that saves produces obedience, leads to good fruit, good deeds, those that are established in the word of God. It's just that simple. It is not a difficult message. So when we look here, we see because Moab rejected that, embraced idolatry, that the burden was placed upon Moab. And notice that it comes swiftly, it says, for, and it's word, an evening. It's literally the word, an abbreviated form of the word, Lila, Lail, is an eve, like the eve of some day, the next day. So in that night, we have the word Shudad. Shudad comes from the word to, to still, to be taken away. And here, it talks about being, being taken away, and the outcome is, one of the ways that we might understand it is destruction. So this prophecy is a prophecy of destruction upon Moab. For in a night, a night of destruction, and it has the city, a place, Ar of Moab, it was, and the next phrase, Nidma. This is a word to make something silent or still. And it's a, another word for destruction. So we have two words parallel to one another that speaks about the destruction of Moab that is going to be laid to waste and silent. Once more, it says here, continuing on in verse 1, for in the night of destruction, the second time it's there, Kir, another city of Moab, it is going to be, same word, Nidma, it is going to be rendered silence or still, no movement, no signs of life. So verse 1 speaks about key places, and we'll continue to see key places that were in Moab, that they are going to be stripped away, all of their assets removed, and it's going to be made silent, still no signs of life. Look at verse 2. Why is this? What was their key problem? Well, it says, Allah habayit. Now, the term habayit means the house, but in this case, because it's habayit, we're speaking about a temple. Not the temple in Jerusalem, but their pagan shrine, their place. And notice the parallelism it says here. He goes up to the temple, and then it says, Devon, another important part, some scholars believe the capital of Moab, upon the high places. So we have the term Bamot, the high places, being parallel to this word house or temple. And it says, what's going on at these places? Bechi. What's Bechi? Weeping. They are weeping concerning Navo, Mount Nebo, another key place. And what we find here is that Satan was not successful in the mountain of Nebo, wanting to take Moses' body to hinder the things of God. So they are lamenting at this place, also upon Medva, another important strategic place in the kingdom of Moab. Moab, what will they do? It says Moab will wail, and upon all of its heads, this can be leaders or chief places, there's going to be karcha, which is, is boldness. And in this case, we're talking about an expression of, of shame. Biblically, being bald-headed, I'm almost there, is a, a symbol of shame. So they're going to be made shame and every beard were garua. Garua means something that is worse or lacking. So it has to do here probably with the idea of that, that there's going to be a bald head, meaning shaved, and a beard that's removed that's no more or destroyed. So these are signs, and we'll see this in a moment, of remorse. Now, not a biblical repentance, 
but simply mourning, a, a sign of great grief. Why? Because of their defeat. Look now to verse 3. In its streets, they, they gird sackcloth, another sign of death, mourning. And upon their rooftops, meaning her rooftops, the rooftops of Moab, and in their, their squares, their main city streets, all of them, there's going to be wailing, great remorse. And coming down upon them is going to be once more Bechi, weeping. So over and over in these first few verses, we see weeping, destruction, no signs of life, but rather mourning. Now move on to, to verse 4. Again, some of the key places we have. And will shout, Cheshbon, and also Al Ale, unto a place called Yahatz. So all of these are known places within the kingdom of Moab. And what we find here is there is the shout. And the shout is like a scream. It shows suffering and remorse, but not a godly remorse, simply a regret for being judged. And there it says their voice is heard, therefore, Chalutse, Moab, and this is probably speaking of a, a, a group of soldiers who were armed for battle who are the front line, the best soldiers. In modern Hebrew, this is used for a forward on a soccer team, those that, that charge, that make the goal, that win. Well, it says here concerning this, which probably refers to their best soldiers. It says, and the soldiers of, of Moab, they are going to lift up shout, but this is going to be a shout of regret. And also his soul, the soul of Moab, is going to, to shout the same word in regard to, to him, meaning the destruction of Moab. Verse 5. My heart for Moab, and this means anyone's heart for Moab, will cry out. And we read here, those who flee, and it's a word for fleeing from destruction, it says those who will be its, its uh, uh, refugees, they are going to arrive all the way to Tsoar. And as, and look at this, we have the phrase, Eglat Shlishia. This is a calf that's three years old. And this was a, a prime time to, to kill, to slaughter a calf. And the imagery is that Moab, in the prime of her empire, is going to be taken down, destroyed, quickly in an instant. That's what the scripture is trying to, to reveal to us. And thus, the one that goes up upon, and it's a way of Luchit, this one, in weeping, will travel upon it, go up upon it. For the way of Horonayim, is going to be a way of tzakat shever. Tzakat is a scream of shever. has to do with the word for destruction. Now, in the modern Hebrew New Testament, when they say uh, uh, they proclaim peace, then there's going to be sudden destruction. They use this phrase as well, an Old Testament word, obviously, Hebrew New Testament, takes from the, the Old Testament, the, the language. So it's speaking about destruction is going to be upon those who, who travel this way. And then finally it says, those that, this is the modern Hebrew word that if you go to court and the verdict is against you, you can appeal it. And it says that they'll want to appeal this, but we know there's no appellate court with the courts of God. God deems it, he judges, and that's it. Because his judgment is a mishpat sedek, a righteous judgment. So there'll be no appeal. Verse 6. For the waters of Nimrayim, they will be desolate. Also it says here, 
four will dry up the chatzir. The chatzir is the, the grass. Also, all of the grass, and this is the word for a lush lawn. Now, we have this word chatzir, which is kind of like wild grass or prairie grass. You go out into a prairie and you see the, the grass there is usually higher and thicker and such, more brittle or stronger. But then you have the, the lush lawn, the grass that, that you like to walk barefooted upon. This is deshe. And it says concerning this, this lush grass, it says there will no longer be any green. So it speaks about an absence of water. This goes along with the first part of that verse, what it says, for the waters of Nimrim, Nimrim will be destroyed. No water. Everything is going to be destroyed. Look now to verse 7. Therefore, what he remains, what remains that he's done that remains, and what they have deposited, meaning what they have stored away for difficult times, perhaps food, perhaps uh, weapons, ever, all their preparation for difficult times. It says, which is upon the, the, the river of Arabayim. Now, this word, literally Ha-Aravim, excuse me, it says here that all of this preparation there is going to be lifted up. All of this is going to be lifted up, and the implication is, taken away, removed, or lifted up, up for destruction. So there's nothing good here. There's nothing that's mentioned with any grace, any calls of forgiveness. This is God's judgment that expresses his wrath. Look now to verse 8. For screaming will surround the, the border of Moab. Now just think of this. You have, and it's a description. Anyone who stands upon the border and looks towards Moab, what, what do they do? They scream out. Oftentimes when you see a horrible thing happening, you, you express that. And this is what it's saying. But this horrible thing is, is for a right purpose. It's the judgment of God expresses his righteousness. For screaming will surround the border of Moab unto the place called Eglion, where there's going to be wailing, and also to the, the well of Elim, that's the ram's well, there's also going to be, be wailing, lamentation. So over and over, we see this same description of suffering. Our last verse, verse 19. For the waters of Demon, Demon, the capital, for the waters of Demon will be full of blood. For I will place upon Demon, no se fault, old more judgment, more destruction. For who? For the refugee of Moab, those who are escaping, fleeing. God says, I've got more judgment from those from the capital that are fleed, which is usually the strongest, the more, most fortified place. God remains, has remaining more judgment for those who, who were not killed on the first first onslaught and it says a lion and this is simply a, a description of of judgment a lion for those who remained upon the land so god is going to place judgment moab will not have any of those who escape and it's simply warning us warning us that those who stand in opposition to God's purposes, his purposes for Israel, remember Moab's heritage with Balak and Balaam, with 
their origin with the daughters of Lot. Remember what the word of God says about the people of Moab who did not want to meet Israel with water and supplies to participate and bless them in their land. No, they wanted to profit from Israel, not by blessing them, but but by thinking about their own will. And this is that heritage that God will destroy. When we are committed to what we think is best for us according to our vision for ourselves, rather than hearing God's prophetic purposes and submitting and obeying and participating in them. Not a difficult message, but a message that certainly needs to be read and studied and pronounced throughout this world. Because more and more, what we see is people not understanding prophetic truth, teaching, living, behaving in a way that is in opposition. We see a need for repentance. And prophecy is a catalyst to bring about a change in a person's life. Well, I'll stop then until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.